and or good morning as the case may be. And welcome back in. Looking forward to hearing from Dr. David Minnick in just a bit. And um, from there, we'll, he'll introduce his topic. We've heard from him before. Uh, but looking forward to what he's going to share with us specifically in textuality and, as I understand it, focused in Revelation. Um, I wanted to give two points of uh, just introductory, introductory kind of administrative stuff as we get into some details here. One is I want to remind you again, there is on the forum a place to put any specific questions you might have. So these would be things as you work through the data or as you've read, done readings, anything else that's come up and you feel like you would like a more extended answer on that question, um, that's underneath the discussion board. And so this is just any kind of further discussion you want to have. Um, in fact, maybe what I'll do in order to make this clear is just I'll set up a specific forum for this. And what we've done with every class so far is that when we get to the end, we work through your submitted questions. That's one of the closing lectures and we just go through question by question. So that's one of the, the final lectures we have here. All right, so if you'd like, a, there's a certain topic, a certain idea, or something you'd like a little bit more elaboration on, the sooner you can let me know, the better, uh, because what I've done in, in some cases is I've pulled in guys who maybe have a special interest in that field or who have done particular work on that. So it would, it would be ideal, if possible, uh, if you're able to get that in to me soon. And uh, as I said, what I've, I've had, we've had the forum on there, but, or the discussion board, I'll add a separate discussion board that will just be student submitted questions. It'll be right up there at the top. Uh, that'll be on there maybe in, in another, uh, well, before we finish today. So I'll get that up there and then any submitted questions you wanna have further discussion on. Okay, and then one other thing, and uh, this is somewhat elective, but for those of you that are taking the course for credit, I. This, this, I'd like to ask you to do this as part of your uh, assignments. And that is when we get towards the end, I would like in one of our, I, December 2nd, I have down as student presentations. I'd like you to work on, thoroughly work on one or two, really I would prefer two, passages that are cases of intertextuality where you just go deep. You just do a deep dive on two specific passages. Um, if if, uh, if it's okay, unless you have a really specific interest, in which case, just message me. But maybe not from Matthew, because I'm doing a lecture on that later on. So I'll try to work through as many of the Matthew passages as I can. Um, but as I said, if you're really interested in a specific Matthew passage, I mean, really one that you wanted to work on, that's okay. Let me know, and I'll just omit that from my lecture. Um, that's okay, too. But otherwise, if you want to work on you know, any number of different passages. And then as you know what passages you want to work on, uh, drop that in as well. You should claim that. In fact, I guess probably I should have a separate forum category for that. But just, I'll put that in our general forum. And inside of there, uh, I'll just label in there passages claimed. And as you have two passages you want to do, drop in a message, I'm taking these two passages so that we don't duplicate. Uh, because I'd, you know, I'd like to get in the final lecture separate. So we're not covering the same material multiple times. Okay, if that makes sense. So you would plan on having, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes to talk through deep diving on two passages, um, and then preferably not Matthew, but if you really are interested in Matthew, let me know, and then claim those passages by dropping that into that form. Okay, any questions, put that into the chat, and I can catch that during the break or something like that, but that's what we're looking for. Okay, last point would be for the paper for the course. And so uh, the paper on the court for the whole course, final paper for the course would depend on whether you're doing this uh, on the master level or on the doctoral level. And uh, thank you for the question there, clarification, not from Matthew. Um, so we're looking for something other than Matthew, unless you really, really want something, in which case I can cover it. And yeah, there you go. Uh, Duncan, um, two passages in 10 minutes, each passage gets five to seven, five, five to seven minutes. Um, okay, so the last thing is the paper, depending on whether you're master's or doctoral level, and I, I can put the syllabus uh, with the layouts of reading requirements and page numbers and so forth uh, into the chat. But on this point, what I would ask you to do is an extension of what I just said. So again, you could do one or two, and I'm happy for it to be the same passage as you did for your presentation. Okay, so it just you can really nerd out and go far into these. And um, 
So you would, in your paper, just present one or two passages that are, you're, you're going through the full, the full analysis of it. And that's going to obviously involve basically what Beale and Carson do. That's going to involve, you're going through the Old Testament context, the New Testament context, as you're able doing the text criticism, text, text comparison work, where you're looking at Hebrew, uh, Septuagint, Greek, and you're noticing the differences between them. If there is a textual issue, you're working through that. And then you're working through the context, both of them really thoroughly. So you've got to read several commentaries on both Old Testament, New Testament side. And then the last piece, and this is where I wouldn't mind sometimes if the, um, the Beale Carson commentary went a little further, but talk through the, the biblical theology and theological implications. So there's, there's significance to these kinds of things. My devotions this morning, I got into the pattern of Jesus as the cornerstone that was rejected. And I ended up with like 10 passages that tie into this. It's mind blowing. I still haven't figured it out. I ran out of time, had to go to class. <laughs> that kind of thing, right? Okay, so do that. Talk through the theological implications. What, is it, what, what are the concepts in here? What's it saying about Jesus? What's it saying about fulfillment? What's it saying about an already not yet? All, all these things, okay? Uh, work through those kinds of details, that kind of information. All right, if you have questions, I don't wanna take any more of Dr. Minnick's time, but drop that in the chat and I can pick that up later or we can chat about it on the, uh, the forum and so forth. Okay, uh, Dr. Minnick, you've met him before. And uh, I knew him from my home church, and then he also went to the same seminary as I. Uh, he finished out his dissertation, and it's, it is the, the discussion we're going to have today. So he'll be talking us through some of that. He's right now finishing out uh, his preparation to go to Australia. So he's planning to serve as a missionary there, and just doing right now the fundraising preparation, and then, uh, then headed out. And so anyway, I hope to continue to hear from Dr. Minnick here as, as the Lord gives us that opportunity. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to what he's going to share with us today. So if I can ask uh, Pastor Harlarsis, if you're willing to pray for us, just to open us out. And then right after that, I'll hand the time over to Dr. Minnick and we'll, we'll jump in. Just looking. Okay, I think possibly Pastor Halarsis' uh, connection dropped. So I'll start us out. Let's pray. Father, thank you very much for the richness of your word. The more we study it, the more in awe we are. And every time we come back to these texts and back to this book and back to the connections and the richness of it all, uh, we're in. We're amazed. We're in awe. It clearly is the hand of an infinite mind writing in such rich ways that people across the world and across all time can, can read these words, be touched and transformed by these words and confess with all of their hearts. And we confess with all of our hearts that truly this is the words of the living God. We thank you tonight as we talk about this final section, Revelation, the conclusion of it all, and then seeing how so many strands from beginning to end all come together here and they find their unity they already have their unity, but they, they come together in an even richer way at the conclusion of this entire rich book. So we're praying tonight you would help us uh, aid our minds, whatever other distractions we have or weariness we have. Uh, pray that you would give us strength and grace now to focus, think, understand, and then just again to, to be in awe once again at the richness of what you have said and what you have given us. So we ask your help. We thank you also for Dr. Minnick, his diligence, his, his, the labor of years that's represented here and his willingness to share that with us now. So we pray that you would um, help us to maximally benefit from the labor that he's already invested on our behalf and help us to come away challenged through what we hear. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I guess I'm on. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not feeling super well this morning. I feel like I'm going to be a, a chore to have to listen to. Um, we've been traveling for the last three months throughout the U.S. And I'm in the Lord's providence. We haven't had any sickness at all. But the day we got back yesterday, I came down with something. and So uh, I'm a little under the weather this morning. But uh, hopefully we can still communicate. Um, as Dr. Arnold said, I uh, wrote my dissertation in this field, or at least one chapter of it, and uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to uh, go really deep uh, into um, a topic and an area
area of study that I, I think helped me at least to grasp something of the significance of the way that Revelation is put together and uh, also to help me to understand uh, how to make use of some of these ideas of intertextuality uh, in preaching and teaching. So just a little roadmap for you today, um, <clears throat> what I hope to cover. I want to um, help you to understand how prevalent uh, intertextuality uh, links both to Old and New Testament, how prevalent that is in the book of Revelation. So this was surprising to me. I had an idea of um, how much uh, Revelation relies upon previous material and connects to it. But it wasn't until I really started uh, looking carefully at that in my dissertation that uh, um, I was surprised at how much there was. So I want to help you to understand that a little bit with some, uh, with some data. And then I want to work through the whole idea of what is intratextuality in Revelation, and I'll define that term uh, in a little bit for you. Um, and then I want to try to do a little bit of work. In the dissertation, I was coining a new term, intratextuality, which we'll discuss in a little bit that I didn't find in any secondary literature. So it was a new idea for the field, and so I needed to lay a pretty solid philosophical uh, foundation for that. So I want to do just a little bit with that, mainly to help you understand the way that I think about this. Um, I could throw a lot of facts at you, um, and as fast as you could write those down, you could preserve them. But I think if, uh, if you can come to think about intertextuality uh, in just a little bit more of a philosophical way, you'll be able to transfer that understanding to other passages of Scripture and know what to do with them uh, and how to uh, mine the significance of those. So a little bit of work with recognizing and testing uh, examples of intertextuality, and then uh, a little bit of uh, work hopefully on the significance, uh, de developing the significance. You know, we, we see these um, examples of intertextuality. We see an author quoting himself or, or previous work. Uh, why, why does he do that? And uh, what is the what's his purpose? And uh, what what does that mean for the church today? Uh, it's one thing to develop a, a, a great list of, of examples of this. Another thing to actually make spiritual benefit of them uh, in understanding what God has revealed to us in the Scripture. I want to go through then three examples that I go through in my dissertation in Revelation that I think each point out a different um, aspect of something that we can take away uh, from from this and hopefully will help you to understand what we're doing. And then I have a brand new um, example of in intertextuality, Revelation alluding to uh, possibly a New Testament text that I have not done any work on at all. I just noticed it and I thought I'd throw it at you and we'd work on it together. And then uh, I have an example as well of um, using intertextuality in preaching from a different book of scripture, the book of Colossians. So uh, let's jump in here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up, um, well, maybe I should start this way. Um, there are approximately 9,000 words in the book of Revelation in the Greek text. There are 404 verses in the English Bible, uh, so counting the New American Standard Bible. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how much of that uh, actually uh, scholars have discovered um, intertextual links in, in, in so much of that. Um, <clears throat> if you took the Greek New Testament that Westcott and Hort put together 150 years ago, and uh, if you look in the appendix, they have a listing of um, all the examples of intertextuality. They didn't call it that. But all the examples of intertextuality links to the Old Testament, allusions to the Old Testament. And of the 404 verses in Revelation, they're finding uh, intertextual links in 278 of them, which is approximately 70%. The 70% of the verses in Revelation, um, they are finding connections to the Old Testament. I think Dr. Arnold showed you the Lagos um, Intertextuality Interactive. And uh, if you look at that, they're listing 590 allusions, echoes, or quotations. If you open up a modern uh, Greek New Testament, like the uh, United Bible Society, uh, fourth edition, uh, they have a similar appendix in the back to what West and Hort did, and they are listing 607 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. 
Um, so assuming, you know, I mentioned that we have about 9,000 uh, words in Revelation. If you assume that, uh, well, I, I did, I, I did the, uh, the search. If you chop out all the articles, all the conjunctions, all the relative pronouns, um, you're left with about 5,500 words. Um, and if you assume that an intertextual echo of the Old Testament uses on average two words, so that link might be uh, two words, three words, one word. If you assume that uh, each echo is about two words, that means about 1,200 words out of Revelation 5,800 are directly elusive to the Old Testament, and that equals about 22%. So it's hard to nail down exactly how much of Revelation is elusive without doing more work than I had time for to prepare for this lecture. But uh, you can see that there's a good bit uh, in Revelation, I think. And what I did was I went to um, a couple of commentaries that I have. And um, let me just put this up here for you. Uh, this is, <clears throat> this is uh, Sweet's commentary um, on the book of Revelation. And what he's done is he's categorized the use of the Old Testament and other literature. And what he's doing, he's got two parallel columns here, the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation. It's all in Roman numerals, a little harder for us to read today. But uh, the Apocalypse on the left side, of the left column, Greek versions of the Old Testament um, on the right column. And he's listing the parallel uh, between the two, the, the uh, examples of intertextuality. And I'm not going to necessarily look at any of those in particular. We'll look at one passage in, the, in Revelation 1 here in a second. But I just want you to get an idea of how much of Revelation... Uh, really is um, tied in very closely, even verbally, uh, to the Old Testament, and uh, the pages just keep going on and on. Uh, so this is Sweet's commentary, and he has some analysis I'm going to skip past here. Um, but this is R.H. Charles' commentary in the International Critical Commentary Series, and he's doing the same thing. You see number three here in the top left of the left-hand page, passages based directly on the Hebrew Old Testament. He's noting that there are hardly ever literal quotations, and uh, I would tend to agree with that with one exception. But then the Revelation does not quote the Old Testament, but it does allude to it um, uh, in many different examples. And he's doing a, a, a pretty much exactly what Sweet was doing. But the thing about Charles' commentary, if you are interested in this and you want a resource, Charles has all these echoes of the Old Testament. He's also looking at echoes of the pseudepigrapha. Um, and then this was helpful for me. These are echoes that he's finding between intertextual links between Revelation and the New Testament. So Revelation 1.1 1, 1 at the top of top left here, linking to Matthew 24.6, Luke 21.9. And he's got two whole pages there uh, plus a third page. Uh, so as you can see, um, a, lot of, a lot of connection between the two. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, there you go, Dr. Arnold's got a, a link to that. Uh, Revelation alluding primarily to the Old Testament, not citing the Old Testament. Yes, yeah. uh, that brings up an interesting question. Are there any quotations in Revelation of the Old Testament? Uh, most scholars are going to say no. Um, it depends on how you define quotations. And that's what gets really sticky in the discussion of intertextuality, intertextuality. Uh, what constitutes a legitimate example of intertextuality? Uh, how many words have to be in place that match the original text um, in order to consider this a legitimate, legitimate example? So uh, um, if you wanted to quantify that, <clears throat> um, I have not found anybody who, who has done that. I think Dr. Arnold mentioned in his opening lecture that this is kind of a, a new uh, field of study in uh, biblical studies, or the application of the idea of intertextuality from the literary field to biblical studies is relatively new. So if you wanted to do something for a dissertation and you wanted to dive into establishing criteria, uh, I think the, uh, the theological world would thank you for that. Um, at this point, uh, it's kind of, as I have read, it's kind of everybody's game. Um, and we'll go through some criteria here in a little bit, but uh, you're basically you have to substantiate every instance for yourself if you want to claim it as, as intertextuality. There's no hard and fast rules uh, that have been set in place that I have found. Okay, and we've got sweet, it looks like, um, from 
Duncan Johnson, so thank you, Duncan. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that gives you a little idea of um, how much of the Old Testament. Just a couple more facts here that um, might be helpful, uh, and you'll find these in suite. Revelation alludes to every portion of the Old Testament canon, all three of the main divisions, law, prophets, and writing. He alludes to the following Old Testament books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and seven of the 12 minor prophets. Uh, meaning that the only books not alluded to in Revelation are Joshua, Ruth, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Ecclesiastes, and five of the minor prophets. And this is an interesting fact, I think, that uh, might give you an idea of um, what books you might, be, what, might want to be familiar with coming into the book of Revelation. Uh, one half of the quotations come from either Psalm, Isaiah, or uh, Ezekiel or Daniel. Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. And the book of Daniel, uh, in proportion to its length, is the most heavily cited of any book in the Old Testament. So a lot of facts here. We'll get into a little discussion here in a minute, but just want to get you um, thinking along the line that Revelation is very heavily in debt. Uh, John's made heavy use of previous passages. So what about the New Testament? I showed you Charles' work there linking Revelation to the New Testament. Charles cites 78 New Testament passages to which Revelation alludes, and his analysis leads him to conclude that Revelation alludes to Matthew, Luke, 1 Thessalonians, both books of Corinthians, Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, 1 Peter, and James. So an interesting uh, thing to think about there, and this is something that we'll come to a little bit more, uh, you know, we, we, we do a lot with the idea of New Testament introduction, um, trying to understand who wrote a book in the New Testament, when was it written, uh, what was the purpose, what was the provenance, where was it written from, who was it written to. And that can actually really be helpful in uh, establishing whether or not a supposed example of intertextuality is actually valid. Uh, for example, you, you probably are familiar with, it, familiar with the fact that James seems to have been written fairly early. To find James, to find an allusion in James to the book of Revelation is fairly anachronistic because, uh, in fact, uh, that, that would probably be considered an impossibility. Uh, and the reason for that is because Revelation is written after James. So to find James alluding to a book that's written previous to, uh, written subsequent to its own writing um, is, uh, is problematic on many levels. So um, it's important to know the dates of those New Testament books. Um, <clears throat> so let me put up uh, my chapter of dissertation here and uh, try to help you to understand. I was hoping you would get a chance to read this before. And, um, I didn't get that to Dr. Arlo quickly enough. So that's, uh, that's my fault. Um, but uh, let me just share this with you. Um, and what I'm primarily concerned about here is defining some terms and uh, helping you to understand what, uh, what intratextuality is. Uh, this idea that uh, I have come up with all on my own. <laughs> um, so in my dissertation, uh, I wanted to know uh, why in the book of Revelation, which is prophetic, uh, beginning with chapter 4, Revelation is entirely prophetic. Um, why is it that uh, a book, let me switch back over here. Why is it that a book that's largely prophecy has appended to the front of it seven letters to seven first century churches. Um, and I, I stumbled upon that idea as I was writing a paper for class. And I really wanted to know what's the link between the two. And as I looked at commentaries and things, I began to understand that nobody really seemed to have any idea why they're stuck together. Um, the first three chapters of Revelation are pretty much dealt with. You, you can buy commentaries that are devoted just to those three chapters. Um, so what I wanted to do was establish uh, connections between the two sections of the book, the eschatological portion and the letters, and try to determine, uh, based on those connections, what the significance of the link between the two is. Um, and you can read my dissertation to come to the conclusion on that. Um, but uh, chapter two, the second chapter of my, my work, focused on intratextuality. 
Um, and let me put that back up here for you. Let's just look at the title together. Okay, here we go. Okay, intratextuality. And examine, uh, this chapter is an examination of intratextual lexical parallels. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at verbal parallels, uh, words that, uh, word sequences that are parallel between the letters. And I employ this terminology um, in my dissertation, the visions, basically to refer to chapters 4 through 22. So an examination of the lexical parallels between the letters and the visions, <clears throat> and then an analysis of the significance of those, um, of those parallels. <clears throat> so let me show you, I came up with something very similar to what you see, what you saw with Sweet and, um, <clears throat> and Charles. So here's a table of uh, what I'm finding as probable intratextual links between the letters on the one hand and the visions on the other. So here, <clears throat> the one holding the seven stars in the right hand, uh, the right hand shows up in 2-1, it also shows up in 116, 117, 120, 521. <clears throat> I saw upon, saw in the right hand a book referring to the right hand of the father who sits upon the throne. Chapter 5, verse 7, the lamb takes the uh, book from the hand of the one sitting upon the throne. Uh, seven lampstands that are golden. Um, he sees the same thing in 112, which happens to refer to chapter 2, verse 1, uh, to the same um, entity, the churches. <clears throat> but then you come to 11.4, it's referring to the seven, or the, the two witnesses uh, in the beginning of ministry at the midpoint of the tribulation, he sees two lampstands. And as you look at that passage, you find out that uh, there's a lot of um, connections in the context between chapter 11, chapter 1 and 2. And they both, both chapter 11 and chapter 1 and 2, allude commonly to Zechariah 4, where there are seven, uh, there's a lampstand with seven branches. Uh, repentance. Uh, is another link that uh, seems significant to me. Um, the one having ears to hear, let him hear. You see the same thing in 13.9. Whoever is having ears to hear, uh, let him hear. Whoever is having ears, let him hear. Uh, so this is, uh, this is basically what the chapter is about. <clears throat> so what's preceding us here that I'm scrolling back up to is uh, philosophical consideration. And I want to try to work through the, um, because your job as an interpreter of scripture is not to see things in scripture. Um, it always bugs me when a preacher stands up and says, I see three things in this passage that I want to show you today. Um, the, the, the preacher, the exegete's role is not to see things in scripture. The people don't want to know what you saw in scripture. What our job is, is to find what God put into the scripture. And the only way of establishing that is thinking very carefully about the scripture and what it says. It involves looking at the text very closely and uh, determining uh, in combination with the philosophy of hermeneutics, uh, going about the task of exegesis uh, very carefully in order not to find things, but to discover what is there. So, <clears throat> um, and maybe before we get going here, I'll just take a look. Uh, Okay, nothing new that I need to address. Good. So, um, coining a new term that I did, intratextuality, um, I wanted to lay a philosophical foundation. So, um, let me just uh, read through um, a little bit of this, if you don't mind. I'll put it back up for you, and I will read through it together. And please feel free to jump in if you have a question. Um, I really hate to throw a lot of data at you and not have a lot of discussion and interaction you probably uh, will be more helped if I can draw out your thinking or you can draw out my patterns of thinking and we can discuss those than if I just throw data at you and you um, copy it all down. So it's coming to think about these things and that's why I want to go through this philosophy. Coming to think about these things is probably, probably more, coming to think about them correctly is probably more important than, uh, than actually getting a table of all the intertextual links. So let me put up the, uh, the dissertation here, and I will work through the first opening paragraph here. Uh, intertextuality is a literary phenomenon in which an author links his work 
in the previous work by means of verbal or syntactic congruity. And uh, this is, as you can see from the footnote, um, <clears throat> 2010, uh, it was a good discussion of the historical development of the study of intertextuality among literary critics in this dissertation. Um, and if you're interested about how that got imported into uh, the field of uh, biblical studies, you can read this dissertation or read something by Beale. I think uh, Dr. Arnold had, uh, had, a, had a book that he recommended by him, uh, John's Use of the Old Testament, which is very helpful as well. I've read it. Such echoes of previous works expose the writer's understanding of how his work connects to previous works. And that's something that's really important <clears throat> to grasp hold of. Um, that basically is the foundation of my entire chapter here. That when you look at the way that a writer has linked his work to previous works, that betrays something of his understanding of the relationship that he views his work to have to previous works. And of course, when you come to the book of Revelation, I think you can see that as John links his work, uh, the Holy Spirit directs him to allude so frequently to the Old Testament, uh, that that gives us some understanding of history. It gives us some understanding of the events in Revelation and how we're supposed to connect those to the Old Testament. So intertextuality can occur at many levels, and this is what Dr. Arnold was trying to get at in this first lecture, that it's not just New Testament linking back to the Old Testament. A writer may link his work to the work of another. So John might uh, link back to the writing of Jeremiah. A writer may link his work to another work within the corpus of his own literary production. So the Apostle John in Revelation, I think, alludes back to his gospel, the Gospel of John. He may link a passage within his work to another passage within that same work. <clears throat> and here we're getting very close to the line that exists, in my mind, between uh, verbal intertextuality, literary um, um, uh, lexical parallelism, and the idea of just the development of a theme uh, throughout a um, throughout a particular, particular literary work, and we'll do a little bit more with that distinction a little bit. But here's the uh, thesis, basically, of the chapter. By means of intertextuality, John links the book of Revelation to nearly every other part of Scripture. He employs intertextuality across various passages within the book of Revelation, though. And that's what this chapter focuses on. John's not only linking back to the Old Testament, he's not only linking back to the New Testament, the books that have come before, He's linking uh, to different sections within the book of Revelation. Primarily, what I'm studying is from the visions back to the letters and from the letters forward to the vision. And hereafter, this phenomenon within Revelation will be termed intratextuality. Study of intratextuality within Revelation illumines the reader's understanding of the connection between the letters and the vision. As a result, the study of intratextuality in Revelation will contribute to the thesis that the letters define the hortatory significance of the eschatological doctrine of the other division. So that is the thesis there of my dissertation. The letters are the application of that doctrine of eschatology uh, to those seven churches. So some philosophical considerations here. <clears throat> this is what I was just touching on previously, identifying the phenomenon of intertextuality and interpreting its significance is not easy. And you can see the link to this footnote. And that I hope in just visual form indicates that uh, uh, there's really, as I said, no hard and fast rules for defining what is a legitimate intertextual link and what is not. The criteria by which literary critics differentiate intentional and unintentional similarities, patterns, parallels is not well established. Further complicating the matter is the question of what role authorial intent plays as umpire in the pursuit of meaning. Postmodern theories of literary criticism, such as reader response theory, locate the hermeneutical meaning event within the reader himself. And as a result of such theories, laying a sound methodological foundation is essential. And we've got to address two questions. Let me just stop there. And uh, I want you, if you would, to, um, <clears throat> uh, Duncan, let's see, hold on. So is Duncan, the author's own work, intertextuality, or just saying, as I've said elsewhere? Yes, we'll get to that. Good question. Uh, that came up in my dissertation defense, so good job, Duncan, coming up with that. Uh, what is what is authorial intent? Uh, do you understand that concept? If you would, somebody give me a definition of that in the chat uh, as I keep going here. But um, what I'm trying to get at here is 
So as we go through Revelation, we see these verbal parallels. Um, we see John quoting essentially the Old Testament. And we can catalog those. We can make a list of those. And essentially at that point, we're doing very scientific work. We're just observing. But at some point, we've got to ask the question, why? Why would John do that? At some point, we've got to ask the question, what is significant about his reason for doing that? Is he communicating anything to us? Or is this just something fancy that he's done to prove that he knows the Old Testament really well and can quote from every book of it? Um, and so getting at the significance of that um, as conservative Bible believers, um, I'm hoping that none of you are enamored with the reader response theory. I'm hoping that none of you are into postmodern um, analysis of, um, of the, the text. Um, authorial intent has to be, as I said in, uh, in the dissertation, has to be the umpire in the pursuit of meaning. So what is authorial intent? Anybody have a good, good definition for me of authorial intent? <clears throat> authorial intent? is trying to establish meaning by extrapolating what the author intended to say in the text. So the author controls meaning or has the right to define what the text means. Good. That's good. Um, everybody feel like you understand that. If you don't, please raise your hand. If you don't feel like you understand it, I'm hoping that the next little section here will help. Um, <clears throat> the man who really... Go ahead. Somebody um, I mean, this is maybe a bit of a... Um, yeah, Duncan Johnson's comment here. I mean, so there was a time when authorial intent was in, you could just appeal to that. You could just say, okay, author, authorial intent and be done with it. And so postmodernism and reader response obviously goes off, is way off. Um, but it has taught us some things, which is like, sometimes I might, I might write something and what I intended to say is actually different than what the text says. Um, and I go back and I read it later and it was like, it was clear when I wrote it, but I read it now and I, you know, someone, it went in a different direction. And then a uh, reader response, there's something to it in the sense that, you know, six readers pick up my same text and they come up with six different um, responses to it. So anyway, one of the conclusions this is what I'm asking, curious about, one of the conclusions I've come to is that on, there's only exactly one text, again, as a conservative coming from a conservative theological perspective, I would maintain there's only one text that actually exists in which I can speak of authorial intent being definitive in the proper, like pre postmodern right. sense. Because every other author makes mistakes and means to say something and they end up saying other things, but there's only one infinite mind that has ever written a text. Um, so scripture is the only case where this actually works. What do you think? Right. Yes, yes, no, and that's that's where I'm I'm going with this here. Um, is okay. that, uh, and uh, maybe maybe it's helpful just to um, <clears throat> let me pull this up here, and we'll just go through this definition of terms that uh, hopefully will help with you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there's only two terms in my dissertation that I felt the need to define. One of them is intertextuality, and one of them is intratextuality. Let me read through this and see if this helps. Only two terms in this def dissertation require definition, the term intertextuality, and I define it here, and then intertextuality, and we'll work on that in a minute, defines the literary phenomenon in which an author links his work, a text, with a previous work, a subtext. And we have looked at that. Uh, intertextuality rises to a higher level than simple word meaning. An author takes in hand the context of the illusion in the previous work to make use of it in his own work, and that's significant, the context of the illusion. And so John is essentially calling our attention to the Old Testament context and the illusions that he makes. Such illusions demonstrate the writer's understanding of how his work connects to previous work. By alluding to a previous work, the author links it to context. The chronology of intertextual echoes defines the direction in which the illusion moves. Authors of later works allude to previous works. This is what I was saying about James and Revelation. Subtexts always precede texts in time. The author's text may call up the context of one of the subtexts, but the text does not influence meaning in its subtext. Chapter three and four in this dissertation discuss intratextuality. The term intratextuality derives from the term intertextuality. The term intratextuality does not appear in any secondary literature. The dissertation coins this word 
<clears throat> to describe the literary phenomenon in which the Spirit of God links passages in Revelation with other passages in the same book by means of verbal or syntactic congruities. Intertextuality differs from intertextuality primarily in two ways. First, intratextuality occurs across passages in Revelation. It does not refer to intertextual allusions to other writings outside the book. It's all within Revelation. Intertextuality occurs when the text alludes to a work separate from an antecedent to itself. Uh, verbal allusions within a work to other sections of the same work are not legitimate instances of intertextuality. Nevertheless, in view of the obvious literary and temporal dissimilarity of the letters and the visions of the book, and Duncan, this is getting to your question, uh, in view of the obvious literal, literary and temporal dissimilarity of the letters and the visions in the book, verbal allusions from one of these major sections to the other rises to a greater level than simple verbal repetition. So um, <clears throat> if I could stop there, um, there's a there's a whole theory of the development, the literary development of the book of Revelation. Um, you look at a writer like David Ani uh, in the Word Biblical Commentary series, he sees three stages in the composition of Revelation. The, what I'm calling the visions, chapters four through 22, basically, apparently, according to him, <laughs> floated about as independent Jewish apocalyptic um, units. And at some point, somebody gathered those together into a coherent whole. And then John came along and put on a Christian beginning and a Christian ending to the book. And that's how we got the book of Revelation. The Christian beginning and the Christian ending are the end of chapter 22 and chapters 1 through 3. Now, why does Ani do this? The reason why he goes with a theory of composition like this is because he sees a great deal of difference between the letters and the visions. He says, how, how, could these, how could these things appear in the same book? They're so, dis, they're so disjunctive. It's almost like we've got two separate literary works here that have been jammed together. And so because of that, <clears throat> what we're dealing with between the letters and the visions is not simply a flow of thought. It's not like the Pauline epistles where we're just working down to an argument. Uh, essentially, it's almost as though you do have two different literary corpuses, though I do believe in the literary uh, unity of Revelation, in fact, that John wrote the whole thing. But uh, verbal, as, as I was mentioning here in the dissertation, the obvious literary and then the temporal dissimilarity between the two letters. Uh, one addresses first century churches. The other one addresses things that are yet future. And take this also into account that chapters 2 and 3 have a different author than chapters 4 through 22. Chapters 2 and 3 are verbatim dictation from Christ to uh, John for the seven churches. And... Chapters 4 through 22 are John's record of what he saw. So for that reason, um, it, it, this, this isn't just exactly like what Paul's doing in his letters. Um, I, think there, I think we can consider this um, more than just simple development of, a, of an argument down through a text. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, getting back to the, what we were discussing uh, previously, authorial intent and uh, the supernatural nature of the text. Second, in view of the literary unity of Revelation, intra-textuality moves in both directions in Revelation. So the letters, through allusion, later passages call to mind the context of previous passages, and earlier contexts rely upon later for meaning. So I mentioned James and Revelation. Uh, obviously, James is written earlier than Revelation, so we would expect that Revelation would allude to James, possibly, but not James to Revelation. What do you do when you have a book that's composed of a literary uni unity of such dissimilar character in the two sections? Well, we would expect that the visions would allude back to the letters, but not the other way around. However, this phenomenon demonstrates the remarkable uh, literary unity of Revelation. It also shows clearly the book's supernatural origin. Christ dictated the letters verbatim, and their literary precision is evident. Nevertheless, the subsequent visions appear to be of John's own composition, as his eyewitness account of the visions he received on Patmos. An author can produce an eyewitness record of an event or series of events with such literary precision only after the event has concluded and he possesses knowledge of the whole. So he's, there, there's, there's, a, there's a great degree of literary precision in the book of Revelation, and you see that as you study it all the way through. It does not appear... <clears throat> Well, maybe I should say this. If John is the only author of Revelation, looking at that literary precision tells me 
that he didn't construct this book in hate. And yet, as you read through the book, it's quite clear that these visions are coming at him quickly and he's scribbling things down as fast as he can to record them. So how, how, do, how do we account for the literary precision? Well, there's obviously another author in view here other than just John. And that author is the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we can say that, liter say that what, why, why we do see what we do of Revelation's literal precision. Because the Holy Spirit is superintending these things. So therefore, uh, let me switch back here to uh, official terms. In view of the fact that John apparently composed the book throughout the visionary experience with some haste, the remarkable degree of literary precision evidenced by the presence of intratextuality is possible only by divine guidance and inspiration. It is the scripture's own claim regarding its supernatural origin that accounts for this degree of precision and allows for the movement of intratextuality in both directions. In other words, the Holy Spirit had this in mind from the beginning. And uh, he's superintending the way that John's writing these things so that they appear as they do um, and bear the significance that they do. So getting back to the idea of authorial intent and hopefully sh showing here the, uh, the um, supernatural origin of the book of Revelation. Um, yes, I agree wholeheartedly with what Dr. Arnold was saying that that authorial intent only functions uh, precisely as we would expect that it would in the book of Revelation. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, in, 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 any, in any inspired writing, because uh, God alone is the author, the one author in the history of the universe who has composed an, in, a, a, a perfect, perfect literary composition. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see if we can catch up here um, while I'm in questions. Would intertextuality suggest to be part of parallelism? Yes, it is. It is verbal parallelism. Um, but the question is, uh, is this just the development of an argument? Or does John intend to link to dissimilar uh, literary um, um, compositions? Because as the existence of intertextual function of shock scene to, yeah, good job, John Duncan. <clears throat> okay. Intertextual links, yeah, you can do Isaiah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, linking, letters linking back to chapter one. Sorry, I'm taking time with your questions because uh, I'm hoping that uh, this will help you understand my thinking um, as I answer your questions and I want to understand yours. Do you make a distinction between the letters linking back to chapter one vision and uh, chapter four to 22 visions linking back to the letters? Maybe your dissertation not addressing that issue. Uh, yeah, you, that would be a lot to get into. Um, the structure of Revelation. Um, I'm going to say that if you will read uh, chapter, um, if, if you don't have my dissertation, I can give it to you, Brother Phil. Uh, uh, if you read the first, second, and last chapters, I think that would address that question. That's more than I can get into in this lecture. Um, somebody's on wants to say something. Sounds like. <clears throat> so, um, here's the question that came up in some of the things you discussed a bit ago, a distinction between intertextuality, I think you do intratextuality. <laughs> I was just reading here earlier today, it's a good book. Um, and he was, he, he referenced like Moses in the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy echoing something back in Exodus or Leviticus or something. And so he called that intertextuality. Um, and so s some of this came up last class meeting with uh, Jared Garcia. He spoke or shared, he presented his paper where he had traced development from the gospel of John into the epistles and into revelation. And if you do something like uh, the greatest commandment, I give a new commandment to you that you love one another. So there's this, this little bit of flow that happens with the gospel and then first John. And I think it comes up in second John also. Anyway, stuff like that. Uh, but one faculty member had said that was not intertextuality because it's the same author. Um, and I'm a little bit inclined, even though it's the same author in the way that let's say like a later work of C.S. Lewis, 40 years later, maybe would pull in a little piece or this is a silly thing, but sometimes in the Pixar movies, they'll like make this little silly literary echo where they'll pull in a little piece of Toy Story in the middle of like Monsters University or something. And it, it, it's just fun. It's whimsical. But that feels to me like this kind of concept. Um, anyway, what do you think when it's the same author doing it? 
Yeah, and, and a lot of that is I have, as I read from a dissertation, uh, a lot of those questions um, are just the fact that intertextuality in biblical studies is really new and there's not a lot of uh, consensus. Um, yeah, I mean, it, um, if, 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 if we're gonna, if we're gonna introduce intertextuality into biblical studies at all, and we're gonna be good conservative evangelicals who believe in the inspiration of scripture, well, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, yes, and John might be alluding to it, but there's one author, and that's the Holy Spirit. So we kind of vitiate our, our use of intertextuality if we want to say, well, John can't allude back to the Gospel of John because it's the same author. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I'm, I, I, what, what, what I'm trying to do here is, and you brought up a good point, Dr. Arnold, in pointing out the supernatural nature of the scripture. What I'm trying to say here is that the, the, the scripture functions like no other book. And therefore, we can be very, um, we can be very fanatical about um, looking for the author's meaning and looking for it throughout scripture, seeing these links throughout scripture and not feeling like we're just making stuff up. Um, establishing whether or not this is a legitimate intertextual link is challenging. But in view of the fact that we've got one mind behind all of scripture, we should expect to see continuity. We should expect to see illusions. The Holy Spirit knew what he wrote in Genesis when he was having John compose Revelation. So good point. Um, hopefully that's helpful. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking time with this and letting these questions come with, with a, the question of authorial intent and the supernatural nature of scripture. Because this, this, this is the foundation. This is the philosophical foundation for, for, for dealing with this. Um, authorial intent is the criteria for determining legitimate instances of intertextuality. Um, if, if you see something, if you see what you think is a verbal link, and you cannot demonstrate that that is authorially intended, um, and you go and preach it without any, um, without any substantiation from, your, from the text itself, that this is what Moses, this is what the Holy Spirit intended by this verbal parallel. Then you preach with no authority. Um, it, it, by, by shortcutting the process of, of, anal of analysis on the foundation of, author of, of the idea of authorial intent, um, you're basically chopping the legs right out from underneath um, any authority that you might want to have in preaching. So authorial intent is a criteria for determining legitimate instances of intertextuality. And it also forms the cornerstone of the philosophy for establishing the significance of these things. So again, we note them, we observe them. What's the significance of them? Well, they, they would possess no significance at all if they were not one single mind superintending all of it. They would simply be John's um, <clears throat> flowery addition to a, a, a literary work that we wanted to impress people with, his knowledge of the Old Testament. So, um, as I have thought about this, um, as I've worked with this, um, I, it, it, I, I don't want you to leave this lecture with anything but the words of oral intent ringing in your mind. Um, you've, got to, you've got to be able to demonstrate that from the text if you want to consider what you're seeing legitimate and if you want to really get at the significance. So what are some markers for intertextuality? By that I mean, what, what, um, how, how are you going to recognize this as you're reading through the scripture? Uh, what, are, what are some, some literary conventions that you might see that, that might tip you off that, hey, I should go looking to see if there's a parallel for this somewhere in the Old Testament. Well, there's a, uh, there's a section in the, in the dissertation chapter that looks at markers for intertextuality, quoting from another author, and uh, I won't take you through that. But three that I think are significant in the book of Revelation. The first is um, uh, typical biblical words such as names. So when you see a word such as lamb in chapter five, I want to argue that the use of the word lamb, that single word, is an inter intertextual link back to the Gospel of John. Um, yes, it does carry significance in chapter 5. In fact, we have a lamb who's standing. Uh, a lot of people have done a lot of work with, the, um, with that, that word itself, lamb, perhaps meaning ram, something of strength, an animal of strength, possessing horns. But... 
But the idea of a lamb coming from John, and as you look at that in chapter 5, it's pretty clear that by that single word, John wants to call to your attention, John chapter 1, the Lamb of God who bears away the sins of the world. So just in that single word, that one word, Arneon, we have a intertextual link. And by seeing that, oh, I've, I've read all about a lamb before, and, and all that all that, that John's done in John 1, throughout his gospel, even back into the Old Testament, all of that, the apostle wants, to Im- wants you to import into the context of, Re- of Revelation 5, as you consider that. <clears throat> this lamb who stands, having been slain, who has the, the saints cry, redeemed us to God. You look at a word like uh, Satan in the book of Revelation. You know, the name Satan does not occur with reference to that that demonic person throughout the Old Testament. It does not occur very frequently. I think four or five times. But as you look at, uh, at Revelation chapter 12, the, the Satan, the Satanas, in Revelation 12, as soon as John uses that word, I think it's pretty clear that he wants to call to your mind every one. If you go back and look at every, every occurrence of that with reference to Satan in the Old Testament, I think you'll see that it's pretty clear that John wants to call all of that to your mind by the use of that intertextual link in Revelation chapter 12, by the use of that single word, Satan. So anytime that you see a big word, a big name like that in, um, in, uh, in uh, the scripture, um, you, you might want to go back and, and look. Um, I, I was thinking even the, um, even, even the, the word the of, uh, of God. Um, obviously, when you look at that, let's say in the book of Revelation, John isn't intending that you call the entirety of the Old Testament revelation regarding God into that context. But in, in some sense, all language is elusive. In some sense, every word we use has been used in many contexts before and derives its meaning from those contexts. And so when you see a word like Thaos um, in Revelation, there's a lot from the Old Testament that John wants to come crashing down upon you in your understanding of who that person is to the use of that, of that link uh, in the textuality. So uh, typical biblical words, names, theological terms, there's a lot of uh, linkage that I think uh, rides upon some of those. Quotations, obviously, are another marker of intertextuality, and you often see these with the fulfillment formula. Uh, such and such happen that the scripture might be fulfilled, and then you have the quotation. Uh, I don't think there's any of those in Revelation except the possibility of 1-7, which is Chapter 1, verse 7, which is quite altered from the original text. Uh, and there's no fulfillment formula there, no quotation formula. Uh, so I'm going to set that aside. But as you, as you work through Scripture, when you see a quotation um, in the Scripture that, John, that the writer calls attention to, uh, pay attention to that and go back and look at that context, that Old Testament context. Matching word sequences. Uh, let me show you some of these here in, um, in uh, Logos. What you'll have in Revelation... <clears throat> is you will have a, um, you'll have uh, uh, an intertextual, intertextual link, but one that, uh, uh, sorry, I'm looking for, a, I lost log off through all of my windows that I've opened here. You'll see an intertextual link, but it'll be just a little different uh, than you might be expecting. Let me, uh, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so here's, um, Log off. So if we look at uh, Revelation 1, 16 on the one hand, and uh, Judges 5, 31. Um, if you take a look at my dissertation, you'll see that uh, that there does seem to be um, uh, a, a link between, well, maybe I should call your attention to this, his face shining like the sun in its strength. And uh, here in Judges 5, 21, uh, let those, thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. And uh, most commentators will call your attention to the fact that there seems to be some kind of an echo there. If we look here at the, um, at the Greek text uh, for each of these, you'll see uh, here we have as the sun <clears throat> is shining in its strength. And let's see if we can get the Greek text to pop up over here. That's uh, some kind of a problem here. I'm on Logos, don't let me down here. Try this one more time. 
Uh, does not want to pop up. So <clears throat> let's see if I can just look through that window here. Let me uh let me just uh review. Well you you can you can see in English. It's a little bit different. Um the main difference as I'm reading from a note to you is uh in judges you have host, uh ex hadoff as the exiting, the going forth of the sun. Uh, so the ha is replaced with ex hadoff as the exiting, the going forth of the sun. Uh, and then you don't have a verb. The verbal is bound up in that uh, in that verbal noun exodus. As the exodus, the going forth of the sun in its strength, maybe like the rising of the sun in its might. And uh, you can take a look, particularly in Osborne's commentary, he does some some work on the significance of that link. Um, but but would 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 we consider this intertextuality? Uh, the Greek text is different enough that some might question that. Um, but any time that you have a significant number of words that are similar to a Old Testament passage, if you have a passage in Scripture, uh, you want to you want to sit up and pay attention to that. Um, and as you look through, particularly Charles and Sweet's work, um, you'll see that uh, that some of these um, some of these things that they are calling intertextuality, there is just enough of a difference. There's a genitive instead of a dative case. Or there's a, a different different verb form. Um, here's another one, Revelation 2:17, uh, referring to the water of life. Uh, I think alludes back to John chapter 4 verse 10. Uh, the Samaritan woman, Christ speaking to her, offering to her the water of life. The, the forms are different. Um, in Revelation 2:17, both, I'm sorry, in John 4:10, both of those words are neuter accusative singular. So you have um, uh, Hudor Zoon, and uh, if you want to pull it up in your text, I would hear, but I'm having trouble with Logos um, <clears throat> pulling up the Greek text for me. But in Revelation 2:17, you have the first word neuter accusative singular, the second word is feminine uh, genitive singular. So a different grammatical construction, uh, but I don't think that that vitiates the link. Um, I think even though we're close, um, we're close enough in that. In that, um, in that case. And then another thing that I found fascinating, another marker of intertextuality that you want to be alert for, and then maybe we can take a little break, um, <clears throat> is, uh, struggling with a lot of windows. Here we go. Okay. So, Daniel. In Revelation, there is a, Revelation itself, the whole book of Revelation is structured according to the structure of Daniel chapter 2. Um, and I think I can get at this best with this table. Revelation begins with chapter 1, verse 1, the things which must soon take place. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his bond servants, and it concerns the things which must soon take place. John is told to write things which will soon, which will take place after these things. Come up here, chapter 4, verse 1, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. So, chapter 4 through 22 is those things which must take place, the things which must soon take place, what must take place after these things. And you see that phrase show up in Daniel chapter 2. He made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the latter days. The difference here is it's in the latter days, in the book of Revelation, is that has changed to soon. And the prophecy that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar concerns what would take place in the future. Again, in Revelation, it's going to take place after these things, after the church age, it seems like, from 119. Well, then Revelation moves to those chapters, chapters 4 through 22, which is a vision of Christ's conquest of Gentile nation and the universal kingdom established, which is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar's vision then moves to, vision of Christ's conquest of Gentile nations and the establishment of the universal kingdom. Revelation concludes, the God of the spirits of the prophets and his angel to show to his bond over the things which must soon take place. And Daniel concludes his interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar, the great God has made known to the king what will take place. Again, in the future versus soon, but again, the same sort of terminology. Revelation concludes then with these words are faithful and true. Daniel's interpretation concludes the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Nebuchadnezzar's response as the recipient of the vision is the same as John's response as the recipient of the vision. And so um, <clears throat> I want to argue that uh, what we see here 
the, the connection between these two um, is not on the level of uh, verbal parallelism. It's not on the level of uh, verbal illusion. It's on the level of um, structural similarity and parallelism. And uh, I think that in doing that, John is structuring the whole book of Revelation to call into our mind Daniel chapter 2 to cause us to understand that what's taking place in the book of Revelation is indeed the fulfillment of what God prophesied to Nebuchadnezzar, that great and powerful first of those Gentile kings in the image. So uh, these are, I think, markers of intertextuality. Uh, whenever you find something like this, um, it tends to say to us, yes, I think the Holy Spirit of God did and did intend that we go back and look at that original context and import that into our understanding of the present passage. So, and if you all need a break, I need a swallow of water, take a break and look at a couple of, couple of examples here when we come back. <clears throat> Sounds great. Let's do that. So I'll take a five minute break. I've got eight minutes after the hour. So let's pull back in at 913 and then round out our time. So, great. Thank you. <clears throat> Late or pen down. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that comes up here with this question too. I understand, uh, but there's different views on this. My understanding would be that there are times when the ultimate expression of intertextuality is the divine author, and the human authors in that case are actually speaking better than they know. Um, kind of a, what is that, First Peter, First Peter 1? Uh, where, First Peter 1, 20 and 21. Nice. <laughs> Uh, where they're so they're writing and they're actually going back and looking back and you know, wondering about what what person or what time the spirit was speaking through them. So um, anyway, there's some data. I think that came up in that lecture that we did a couple of weeks ago. We can revisit that again. So yeah, I I agree with that. I, Dr. Minnick, if you want to comment on that or however, then just take it away. It's yours. So. No, and I, I I think I think the most helpful thing that I came out of writing this dissertation chapter <clears throat> with was this principle of uh, authorial intent and thinking through um, thinking through the composition of the New Testament from the divine perspective and from the human author's perspective. Um, if you can learn to think in those kinds of terms, um, you're a step ahead of the competition, if I can say it that way. Um, and you know you're a, a lot of you i think are preachers and teachers um and and what i wouldn't want you to do is go out of this lecture and find all sorts of stuff and stand up in your pulpit and say it um if you can't demonstrate that god intended that then you can say everything you want but with no divine authority um, it's only when you can demonstrate from the scripture uh, that what you're saying is actually intended by John or intended by God himself. Uh, that 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 what you have to say really becomes God's word to men and women, and has the divine authority. So, uh, good questions here. Um, Did I get I your, really, your concept? Go ahead. You know, you made this. I I thought it was fa fabulous, but this point about the Lamb of God, and that that being in some way tied back to the gospel. Gospel of John and even uh, the pattern with Satan. And like that. I I understood the way you were processing not as like a, a totality. What is it? Illegitimate totality transfer, which is more a lexical thing anyway. But m kind of from an apologetics standpoint, as in, okay, look, there's some there's some clear stuff going on that's pulling these together. Not that we pull everything through or something, but and in the case of the gospel, John you know, behold the Lamb of God, I would pull in meaning content between those two because it's such a distinctive, striking yeah. expression. But is that, am I stating your, your view correctly? Yeah, I, I, I think um, inter intertextuality is, brushes up against semantics. In other words, when, when we, when we want to understand the definition of a word, we go to its context in which it occurs. And what, what some want to do is what is properly called illegitimate totality transfer. Every, every meaning that I can find for any word in any context, that's what it means in this context. Um, intertextuality does not function on the semantic level. And, and, and the, the only reason we're, we're dealing with a Greek text and, and individual words is because 
intertextuality by definition is verbal lexical parallelism. Um, so what that means is the significance of these things. I, I'm, I'm not defining lamb in Revelation 5 in terms of every lamb that's ever existed in the, in the Old Testament or in terms of every other lamb that's ever been spoken of in the New Testament. What I am doing is through intertextuality, I think John is tracing a biblical theological link, a biblical theological theme, and he's calling our attention to that by the use of intertextuality. You know, there's, there's many ways that, that a biblical author will, will tip you off that he wants you to think about a biblical theological theme that's been developed through scripture, and now he's going he's gonna to make use of it here. And I think intertextuality is one of those ways that he'll tip you off that, that he's, he's calling up um, previous biblical theological revelation, if that makes sense. So hopefully that's helpful to whoever asked that question about the legitimate totality of I think that might have been something. So good pushback. You guys are welcome to push back as much as you want. Um, I guarantee it, or guarantee you, you are nowhere near as intimidating as a dissertation. Um, committee um, meeting <laughs> with uh, four professors staring you in the face. But uh, let, me, let me go to one example. I think we'll just go through one, and then I want to get a little discussion going about um, Revelation 2 linking to Acts 15 that I think is unclear enough that we will get some discussion. And then I want to look at uh, one example uh, that I've used in preaching, um, and I think that'll wrap up our time. So if you would uh, give me one second here. If, well, I should say this. As you read through my dissertation, I have a section in here called Tests of Intertextuality. And it's in Chapter 3, and I think you will find that helpful. Basically, what I'm asking here and what I'm using Richard Hayes to help me with is how do we determine legitimate instances of intertextuality? In other words, I think I see something. I think I see a parallel. Is this really authorially intended? And Hayes goes through... Things like availability, what's the proposed source of the echo available to the author and readers? So again, that James and Revelation distinction. Uh, volume, how loud is this echo? I mean, are, are we really hearing this or is this just something really faint? <clears throat> Recurrence, do other authors make, you know, if, if you find something in Paul's epistle that seems to allude to Habakkuk 2.4 or that seems to allude to Psalm 110, you're probably on pretty safe ground because Psalm 110 and Habakkuk 2.4 are some of the most quoted sections of the Old Testament that New Testament authors make use of. Um, thematic coherence, historical plausibility, history of interpretation. Are you the first person to see this in church history? If so, you might want to go back and check, <laughs> check yourself, and just overall satisfaction. But anyway, you can read through those case criteria. And then I, I interact with that for a final analysis and summary of methodology. Um, so let me go to an intratextual link in Revelation that I found fascinating. Um, let's see here if I can find it. I want to look at the theme of repentance in Revelation. And uh, here we go. Okay. And uh, if you, maybe I should say this, if you want an example of, of what I've done with this in preaching and teaching, um, I did have the opportunity to preach this at my home church, Mark County Baptist Church in Greenville, um, probably a year and a half ago. If you go to the website and search my name, it should show up. The sermon title is Repent for God's Kingdom Draws Near. And uh, it's basically an exposition of what I'm going to show you now in the book of Revelation. So metanoia is uh, a word that uh, in Revelation, I think, bears intertextual significance between the visions and the letters. Repentance appears frequently in the letters. Christ faces each church with which he finds fault with his command to repent. You're familiar with that. Five times in the letters, Christ calls the churches to repent. But repentance also appears in two passages in the vision. And it's significant where these passages are positioned. So the visions position these references at the conclusion of the sixth trumpet and throughout the bold judgment. And the telescopic structure of the visions means that these two passages, and two repentance passages, occur in connection with the climax of the trumpet judgment and at two points throughout the climax, the bold judgment, in 920 and 16, 16, 9, and 11. God intends the ever-increasing severity of each judgment, and the, 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 the judgments in Revelation do increase in severity, yeah, I, you can find documentation for that in the rest of the dissertation. He intends that the increasing severity of the judgment series pressure men, earth dwellers, in the, in the tribulation 
pressure them more forcefully, ever increasing force to pressure them towards repentance. Nevertheless, even to the end of God's wrath, men remain impenitent. I should not say unrepentant, I should say impenitent. One of those problems you find in your dissertation if you haven't looked at it for a couple of years. The following evidence confirms that John intended to connect the letters to the visions through this intertextual link. So what I want you to see from this is the development of material that proves authorial intent, that proves that John intended that we pick up on what I'm seeing here. And so uh, the material here hopefully will, help, will be helpful in that regard. It also, I think, will show you, give you a little idea of the significance of the link. Why is it that John intended this link? So evidence of a for authorial intent. First, the verbal and syntactic parallels are pretty tight. <clears throat> and you can read through those in the Greek New Testament. The syntactic and verbal con congruity between the letters and the visions gives legitimacy to the link between the occurrences of Metanoia in the letters and the vision. Second, second line of evidence. As table four shows, the two sins that are the big ones in the, in the letters, the two sins common to the letters and these repentance passages in the vision bear significance throughout the remainder of the book. So as you read through the letters, there's two big sins that show up, idolatry, eating meat offered to idols, and sexual immorality. Those are both huge in the letters. And uh, these are just representative um, sections in the letters where they show up. But what's interesting is that passage, one of two in the vision that deals with repentance, also mentions these two, singles them out <clears throat> as two big sins from which earth dwellers refuse to repent. <clears throat> the worship, and then these two are actually developed throughout the remainder of Revelation. The worship of the dragon and the beast develops the concept of false worship. Um, and then Revelation also develops the sin of immorality. Uh, John depicts Babylon as a harlot and so on. So the big sins from which the church must repent in the letters receive pretty, pretty thorough development in the rest of the book. Um, <clears throat> Revelation 13, 8 through 9 is particularly striking. Earth dwellers universally render their worship to the beast. An interpretive comment clarifies the relationship between those who worship the beast and the lamb. Their names are not written in the book of life in chapter 13. Verse 9 makes clear that John intends his readers, the churches, to discern the significance of such a clarification to their situation by a repetition of the call to a the call to fear that appears in seven letters. So let me switch over here to uh, log off and I'll show you what I'm getting at there. Um, if you don't already have this up, let me log off here. Okay. Um, why can't I show you log off? Let's try this one more time. My share screen does not give me log off as an option. Oh, there it is. Okay, coming up now. Share screen. So let's go to <clears throat> Revelation 13, 8, 9. All who dwell on the earth will worship the beast. Everyone whose name has not been written in the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb has been slain. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. Does that sound familiar? That shows up at the end of each one of the letters. And who's the anyone that John's referring to? Who's the reference of this command? Who does John intend to listen? Is this a quote, is this a statement that eschatological earth dwellers are intended to listen to? Or is this a statement that John intends to use to perk up the churches saying, Look at what happens to those who worship the beast, who participate in, in idolatry. If anyone's destined for captivity, the captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and faith of the saints. I think you can see without me reading through this and developing it, that it seems like something interesting is going on here to call to the church's, call exactly what's going on here to the church's attention. Um, <clears throat> You have a similar thing with the sin of immorality. John depicts Babylon as harlot. Horn root occurs 13 times. Babylon experiences great, the great wrath of God. John connects the outpouring of God's wrath upon Babylon with her immorality. And in Re Revelation 18, verse 4, there's the same sort of a thing. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Who is that addressed to? 
Is that addressed to eschatological saints? Who are the my people? If my eschatology as a dispensation of premillennialist is correct, the church is not on earth at this point. Granted, there are many who come to faith in Christ as a result of the proclamation of Israel and the great eagle, many of them in the tribulation. But is this issued only to eschatological saints? Or does John intend to say, here's immorality. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be repaid exactly as you deserve for that. And my people stood up, pay attention, take heed to this fact and repent of their sins. And thus the conclusion is that the two sins common to both unrepentant earth dwellers and the churches, those two sins, receive extensive treatment and development throughout the rest of the book. Meaning that the calls to repent that are issued to earth dwellers and the calls to repent that are issued to the churches for the same sin. Uh, I, I think that there's intended, John intends, that we link the two together. In, in, in this fashion, if you want to remain impenitent in these sins, uh, you basically align yourself with the position where earth dwellers are in the eschaton. And look what happens to them. What can you expect, churches, in the first century, if you remain impenitent? So, second line of evidence. Third line of evidence of authorial intent, a consideration of the words frequently collocated with met not of, further strengthens the contention that the verbal congruity is authorially intended. John frequently collocates erga and metanaio to speak generally of that from which men must repent and must repent from their erga and their deeds. This collocation supports the contention that repentance urged upon the churches and the impenitence of earth dwellers connects intertextually. <clears throat> In all of these passages, twice earth dwellers must repent of their deeds, twice the churches must repent of their deeds. Whether emphasis on erga as the basis on which Christ delivers commendation or or condemnation supports this contention as well. And you can read that out. Fourth line of evidence. Failure to repent brings consequences to the churches that are strikingly similar to the punishment that comes upon unrepentant. It could, again, it should be impenitent. Must have been having a bad night when I was writing this. Impenitent earth dwellers. Table 5 shows that the visions develop the consequences for sin that the letters specify. So what are you, what are you going to suffer if you don't repent? <clears throat> well, in the letters, you're going to suffer the removal of the candlestick, removal of the candlestick from its place. That is strikingly familiar with what happens to the earth under God's wrath. The islands are moved out of their places. Does that mean the islands did anything wrong like the church in Ephesus did? No, but that's, a, that's striking in view of the fact that that's not the only connection between judgment in the letters and the pouring out of wrath in the vision. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And from his mouth issued a sharp sword in order that with it he should strike down the nation. Thyatira, what can you expect if you don't repent? You can expect great tribulation. Her children I will kill with death. What can you expect in the visions under God's wrath? Great tribulation. I will give to them authority to kill with death. You know, the lexicon stumble over that use of Hanukkah. <clears throat> what is it? What 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 is what does that mean in this context? They, BDAG wants to go with something like Thanatos means pestilence, but these are the only two occurrences in the New Testament or in other literature that they can find that seem to support the idea of pestilence. How do you kill someone with death? Why this strange turn of phrase? Unless, perhaps, to make a connection between the two. I will come as a thief if you don't repent. Christ says. I'm coming as a thief to pour out the judgment of God, Christ says in the letter, in the vision. Um, <clears throat> and you can see the last one there. In order uh, that the shame of your nakedness will not appear, repent so that the shame of your nakedness will not appear. And here in the same sort of idea in the vision. So why are the judgments so parallel? Uh, table 5 shows several echoes between the letters and visions that suggest the consequences for impenitence, there we go, I got it right, are common to both the churches and earth dwellers. This highlights the necessity of avoiding such judgment. Taken together, the weight of these parallels is significant, and I think lends credibility to the metanoia of link between the two. The result of this close identification of the consequences gives depth to the significance of that link that I just said. So John ties the visions and the letters together so that the churches will come to view repentance in light of the eschaton. Repentance is the one element lacking for which earth dwellers experience the wrath of God. And Jezebel and those who persist with her in disobedience can expect the same 
if they too refuse to hear the voice of the Spirit of God and repent. So all of that I hope shows that um, uh, that it is possible to develop a filial intent um, and that it requires a lot of work. Obviously, I didn't stumble onto that in an afternoon. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think that um, um, as, as particularly, you know, if you go on, I'm not, not really not trying to promote myself here. But uh, if you want to listen to that sermon, um, I think that it will help you make sense of uh, what the significance of that link is. And I think you can see it there. Uh, John intends to link, to link all impenitent saints in this age with earth dwellers who, are gonna, who refuse to repent in the eschaton. Um, <clears throat> so that's the only one that I'm going to look at here in Revelation. Um, with intratextuality, you can look, there's five of them that I developed there. And incidentally, every one that I have in that table, in chapter three, um, table of intratextuality, at one point in my mind, I could see the significance. I don't know that I remember documenting all of that and having all of that now to give to you. If you wanted to understand what I think the significance of each one of those uh, probable intratextual links is, but I'm sure that as you look at them that you can perhaps develop that for yourself. Um, so what I want to do now is something that I have not looked at. I just noticed it the other day, and I'm hoping we can get maybe a little bit of um, a bit of interaction going here. Um, <clears throat> I want to show you Revelation chapter two, verse twenty-four. Let me pull that up here and share the screen. Um, <clears throat> okay, Revelation two twenty-four. You're looking to pull it up on your own, but uh, don't look at cross references right away. <clears throat> As you see, Revelation 2.24, I've got a section highlighted. I place no other burden on you. And if I mouse over that little C right there, whoops, you will see what the, uh, the New American Standard translators think of as a, uh, as a parallel, a verbal parallel. But uh, let me read to you this whole letter. And uh, I want to see if you think of this phrase as connecting to any other part of Scripture. And if you think that it's a legitimate instance of intertextuality, and what you think the significance of it might be, or if you want to deny it. And uh, I have not looked at this again. I'm looking at this fresh, just as you are. Scripture says, <clears throat> To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love, and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of, of her unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my word, keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I'm going to end the screen sharing here. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, any of you see any place in the rest of Scripture where that phrase, I place no other burden on you, uh, might occur and whether or not you think that there's a link intended, and uh, what was the, uh, what's the significance of the link, can we establish it in the story of intended? Anybody got any ideas? Does that sound familiar to you, or do we have to look at the cross-reference? <clears throat> I place no other burden on you. You can chat. You can open up your microphone. I have nothing, Joel says. Dr. Arnold. Anybody remember that phrase from anywhere else in Scripture? I uh, was wondering about Second Corinthians. Okay. Um, 
Seven? No. Eleven verse nine. When I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers. Okay. So Paul does that several times in Second Corinthians. It seems like the burden yep. is talking about um, his pr expecting financial support from the congregation. And I, I don't okay. think that that should tie into Revelation here. That fit Revelation doesn't seem to. Okay, First Corinthians 7, because of the present distress, they'll be burdened with a wife. Is that what you're thinking, Dr. Arnold? <clears throat> Jump in if you're not. Um, I cannot remember the use of the word burden in First Corinthians 7. Uh, anybody else? Before we look at uh, Look at the um, at the cross reference. I place no other burden on you. Anybody else? Kenneth says, uh, "Give me a minute." So I don't know if a minute has passed yet, Kenneth. But <laughs> you let us know when you give up. <clears throat> we don't want to shortcut your uh, your exegetical insights that are coming here. Anybody else before we look at the cross reference? Well, I gave up a minute ago. Okay. <laughs> well, if I mouse over this in, uh, <clears throat> ah, Acts 15. Good, good, good. Revelation 2, verse 24. And the cross reference is Acts 15, 28, which reads, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. Um, <clears throat> so, here's the question. Do we think that Jesus Christ, who is the speaker here, is intentionally quoting the words that those apostles wrote in that church in Antioch that apparently came, according to Acts 15:28, that apparently came to them through the Holy Spirit, and uh, he sent it to them? And if so, can we find any... Uh, evidence that John intended this as an authorial, that John authorially intended this as a connection. And if we can, what would be the significance? Or do you think that uh, this is not an intended connection? <clears throat> okay, good, good. We've got the, uh, the passage up here. Anything in the context of Acts 15 that is similar to the context of the letter to the church in Thyatira? Seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols would echo their final instructions. Good. Good. Okay. That was what popped into my mind immediately <clears throat> as soon as I uh, saw that. They say to avoid fornication and to eat things with the blood. Okay, that's additional. But uh, you see in uh, Revelation chapter 2 what Jezebel is teaching the people to do in Thyatira is she calls herself a prophetess. She's teaching and leading my bond servants astray to commit acts of immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Acts 15 <clears throat> uh, says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to lay no greater burden upon you than to abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. So things sacrificed to idols uh, is the same Greek word, it looks like, as Revelation 2. Fornication in Acts 15 is the noun form, pornea. Uh, I think in Acts 2, it's pornua, the verb form, the same root. So what do you think? Do you think that John or Jesus Christ intended to call to their minds the uh, Acts 15 letter? And if so, is there any significance? Or do you think that this is not intended? There's no connection. Yep, still processing. Give you a minute to process. <clears throat> I predict that Duncan will be more reserved. I predict the same as well. <laughs> Let's see what the chat turns up here. <clears throat> and you're doing the thinking for me. So I don't have to do the thinking about this. All 
I'll just summarize what we have so far. At present, we have essentially three elements that connect. We have the idea of a greater burden being placed upon, I should say four elements. The idea of a greater burden being placed, that's one element that seems to be parallel. The other is both letters, both John, both Christ's letter in Revelation and the um, Jerusalem Church's letter in Acts 15 are both written to Gentile Christians. That's the second link. But the idea of immorality and the idea of uh, eating meat sacrificed to idols. There are some additional elements in Acts 15, but uh, perhaps the church in Revelation 2, uh, Tyra, was not uh, engaged in eating meat with the blood still in it. Um, the context in Acts 15, I'm just talking out loud while you think. Context in Acts 15 is uh, probably has something to do with the writing of that letter, has something to do with the interaction of Gentile and Jewish Christians and the need to take care for each other's liberties. Uh, you're right, Acts 15 does not have Jezebel. Kenneth, thank you. Does not have Jezebel. Uh, is Jezebel a real live person with that name in Thyatira? Or is this Jezebel also an allusion back to the Old Testament, categorizing this woman prophetess in Thyatira in terms that, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the, uh, the character of Old Testament Jezebel? Okay, Dr. K, only hold fast what you have till I come in uh, Revelation 2. And the truth of the gospel in uh, Acts chapter 15. Good. Another prayer Do you think this is strong enough? Do you think there's enough weight here? Is this echo loud enough that this is a significant instance of intertextuality? I think we need to establish whether or not we really feel like <clears throat> Christ is quoting that letter in Acts 15. And maybe something that would help us think about that is, do you think that the church at Thyatira would have been familiar with that letter that was sent to Antioch? <clears throat> was that disseminated throughout the Greco-Roman world to um, Gentile churches? Uh, Acts chapter 15 says it was written to the Antioch church. Was it, was it uh, circulated beyond that? Okay. I'm happy to see a link, Duncan says. I wouldn't call it clear and indisputable. For once, I think Duncan and I are on the same page with my intertextuality. <clears throat> I think the Acts 15 letter was supposed to be circulated, and I think there's evidence of that in Acts 15, if I remember correctly. Um, as I said, I'm coming at this as fresh as you are. Uh, Acts 15, again, let's see here. Okay. Is that uh, verse 35, Paul and Barnabas staying in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Uh, having received this letter, probably would have carried that on to other Gentile churches since it was Paul's ministry that um, prompted this question, ministry to Gentile churches. Okay, good, uh, good note here from Dr. Arnold. It's helpful, giving clear a backdrop for thinking about the Revelation 2 project, a problem. <clears throat> I'll let you guys go as long as you want on this, and then I'll just tell you what, uh, what I think. Anybody else? Where I could go ahead and say. Yes, there is. It's very striking. It's a very striking parallel. And... Uh, the, the, the trouble that I have is coming up with the significance of why Jesus Christ would have quoted that letter. <clears throat> Does he not himself possess authority? Um, and another good point by Dr. Arnold, this wouldn't readily occur to anyone. Um, and it only occurred to me because I saw the, the cross reference. Um, but apparently it did occur to New American Standard Bible translators, so they included it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that at, at, at minimum, it shows a continuity um, between the two. Um, and if the Thyatira Church is familiar with the Acts 15 letter, um, then uh, I, you know, I, I, I think that it's helpful in seeing that 
things haven't changed. Um, I think Dr. Earl's comment here for theologizing, I want to say something like Jesus is putting his imprimatur on the leadership of human apostolic leadership. That's good. The, uh, the Acts 15 letter does mention that this came from the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Gentile churches would not be understanding this primarily as uh, simply a human ordinance. Um, okay. Well, I'll let you continue to puzzle through that. <clears throat> I think that there's enough evidence there that... Um, yes, good point, Duncan. Slip of the tongue there. These are the words of Jesus in Revelation 2. Um, <clears throat> I'll let you ponder that. I think that there's enough there that is a striking parallel that uh, perhaps we are supposed to think back to that. The other thing that I did notice in Revelation chapter 2, um, if I can get back to myself, and I'm assuming that you're looking at this in your copy of Scripture, so I'm not going to put log off up. But uh, who is the they um, in chapter 24? But I say to you, the rest who in Thyatira, do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. Does the they refer to the false teachers who are uh, imparting information regarding the deep things of Satan? Or is the they referring back to the apostles? And the they call them, uh, linking forwards to, I place no other burden on you. <clears throat> Seems like the particle at the beginning of verse 25, plain, never, translated here, nevertheless, could, uh, it seems like I remember seeing that as possibly connoting a comparison idea, um, or I uh, can't think of the word for it, but perhaps the translation of than, E-H-A-N, would be legitimate. I place no other burden on you other than what you have, which is this. You already have this burden of holding fast until I come. Um, <clears throat> and the big question is, what is the other burden? I place no other burden on you. What was the first burden? And this is, he's not going to give anything other than the first burden. Is the first burden what's communicated in Acts 15? Is the first burden that he places upon them, looking forward to what he's going to say in verse 25? If there's no other burden on you other than this, just simply persevere and hope fast until I come. So a lot of questions there, and uh, I'll let you think about it. My own Thoughts here after a few minutes of thinking about this is that there's striking parallels, but I'm not exactly sure why this would be here and uh, why, why, what, what from the context of Acts 15 should we intend, does John intend, does Christ intend that we import and make use of here in Revelation 2.24? It seems Revelation 2.24 stands on its own terms without needing um, to import anything from, from previous. Okay, yep, and some translation difficulties there, don't you? Yep, uh, translation dif uh, differences. First burden equals repent, good, okay. The problem, I think, with that, Kenneth, is that uh, those two have been faithful. The rest two in Thyatira who are not holding these teachings, they don't know the deep things of Satan, they're not the ones who have anything to repent of. They are the ones who have need of perseverance in what they already have. The repentance is directed at Jezebel. Um, <clears throat> not anything beyond this stuff in the letter. Good. Okay. Yeah, I would tend to see the other burden as referring to chapter, it's referring to verse 25. The need for perseverance. Perseverance is a massive theme in these letters. And uh, in view of the opposition at Thyatira um, that I'm sure was burdening them, um, burdening those who were on Christ's side, uh, there's no other burden other than to persevere and take them to Christ. So you can keep thinking about that. So how to make use of this in <clears throat> teaching and preaching. I'm traveling on deputation at present uh, to different churches. And uh, my sermon that I make use of most frequently is uh, from the book of Colossians. It's kind of a guiding ministry philosophy verse. And I want to show you how I've made use of uh, intertextual, or in this case, intertextual links in the book of Colossians uh, to apply that passage. Let me pull it up to Colossians 128. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I have this all marked up in the uh, in, in log off, and I'm sure there's a way to turn off those markups so that you can see this better. 
but I'm not going to try to, here we go, notes and highlights. If I can turn those off, there we go, okay. So the passage that I've been preaching is this, 128, we preach Christ, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom. For this purpose, this was Paul's goal, this is what he got up in the morning for, this is what drove him, his objective, for this goal that we may present every man complete in Christ, every man perfect in Christ. So at first pass, that passage seems to be directed towards ministers. And so I make the point at the beginning of the sermon that uh, the congregation probably won't need to respond at the invitation, that this is directed mainly to the pastor and to myself, and that they're simply an audience, onlookers, as I preach to the pastor. And of course, I say that tongue-in-cheek because Colossians is not one of the pastoral epistles. Colossians is written to Colossi Baptist Church if you believe that they were Baptist churches back then. Um, it is written to a congregation of believers. <clears throat> and of course, I spent some time on time helping the people understand what it means to preach Christ, what Paul's goal is of presenting every man perfect in Christ on that day. I deal with Paul's goal and then deal with Paul's method of achieving that goal, proclamation of Christ. And then it comes to the point of application. So what? What does this have to do with, uh, with the congregation? Well, as you look through the book of Colossians, we don't have to wonder uh, what Paul intends the congregation to derive from this. And I think if you will go back and look at the flow of thought up to this point and the structure of the book of Colossians up to this point, I think you'll see that what I'm going to show you now is substantiated even within the passage as Paul um, leads up to this and even on into chapter 2. But the application that I make, I make four applications. And let's read this carefully again. Paul's method is preaching Christ. That's what he does every day. He proclaims Christ. And he does that for this goal, presenting every man on that great day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, presenting every man, massive amount of responsibility, presenting every man perfect in Christ. That's what he labors towards, complete. This is the word teleos. I'm sure you're familiar with that. So how do I apply this? The first application that Paul actually himself, I think, makes, and I think if Paul were here, I think he would say, you got it, David. You're, you're seeing what I wanted you to see. The first application that Paul makes is in Colossians 4.3. If Paul has this ministry, then the congregation must respond in this way, praying at the same time for us as well, the responsibility to pray, that God will open up to us a door for the word that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. Paul's method is proclamation of Christ. <clears throat> and he says, would you pray for us that we will have an opportunity, an open door to preach Christ? If this is Paul's goal, presenting every man perfect, and this is his method of preaching Christ, then the congregation must respond to that by praying that God will give him an open door to preach Christ, to speak for us the mystery of Christ. The second passage that I make use of is Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. If this is the goal, and this is the mission, and this is the method, then look at Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Epiphras, probably their pastor, Colossi, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings. Epiphras is always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God, that you may stand teleos. Epiphras prays for the same thing that Paul labors for, and I find this significant because there are very few books in the New Testament that set Jesus Christ as high as does the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians, talk about proclamation of Christ. Paul's doing it here, and he's doing it under inspiration. And you would think that Paul's penning of this book to this church would be sufficient that they would stand perfect on that day. And yet it's not. Because while Paul's writing scriptures then, Epiphras is praying that they may stand teleos. And I think that Paul employs that word at this point <clears throat> in order, yes, it's what Epiphras was praying, but why was Epiphras praying this? He was praying this right alongside of Paul's ministry to them, writing to them the scripture. And so if this is Paul's goal, if this is to be the minister's goal, if this is the missionary's goal, and this is the method that God intends that we employ, the proclamation of Christ, then the congregation 
has a responsibility to pray for those to whom we minister, that they would stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. And then two more applications. And for this, we'll go back and we'll look at how does Paul define proclamation of Christ? Well, there's two ways that he goes about that. Proclamation involves admonition, and it involves teaching. And I want you to notice this whole phrase here. Admonition, that's the verb nuthateo. And teaching, that's the verb didasko. And then you have this prepositional phrase, with all wisdom. Did you know that that exact phrase shows up in the book of Colossians? Does it occur anywhere else in the New Testament? Either one of those verbs with the word wisdom does not occur anywhere else in the New Testament. Either of those verbs together don't occur anywhere else in the New Testament. But that exact phrase shows up in Colossians 3.16. And there's some question about how to punctuate the Greek text. My understanding of it, following Dr. Randy Leedy, uh, who is my Greek professor, and uh, it seems following the punctuation of the New American Standard Bible here is correct. Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. Does Paul intend that we think back to 128 when we read that phrase? I think that he does, but I think what he intends, what the Holy Spirit intends to gain from this, is that the actor here is different. Who's the teacher and who's the admonisher in 318, 316? And who's the audience? Paul does this downtown Corinth. He does this from house to house as he travels about. Here, the audience of the admonition and the teaching is the local church. Within the context of the local church, you, Paul's readers, have the responsibility to teach and admonish in all wisdom your fellow believers. Does Paul intend that? One second here. Go see mommy. Okay. Sorry, I've got one of my boys in here. <clears throat> Does Paul intend? that the Colossian church goes back to 128. I think he does, and I think he intends to say, what I do in pro proclaiming Christ to present every man perfect, you have a responsibility of laboring alongside of me in that. And evidently, the Holy Spirit has left the responsibility for believers standing perfect in Christ on that day. Evidently, the Holy Spirit has left that in the hands of Paul, as he proclaims, the hands of ministers, as they proclaim Christ. But evidently, that also lies in the hands of the congregation, who themselves have the responsibility to speak of Christ to one another, to admonish and teach one another with all wisdom. So there's a little example of making use of um, what, uh, what I'm hoping uh, you saw in Revelation, making use of that perhaps in other passages of Scripture. You might term what I did there in intertextuality. You might term it something else. I don't think the term is particularly significant. I think what you need to come away from this is understanding that, uh, that these things do occur. You need to be on the lookout for them. You need to establish that the Holy Spirit intended them. And you need to make use of them in your preaching and teaching where you can demonstrate that this is what God intended that we do. So any questions there? Um, I know it's 9.02 already. Um, but... Uh, hmm. Yeah, I like that, uh, Dr. K. Two different genres, using the word intertextuality. And when it's all essentially one genre, I'd say the author is emphasizing a point or developing it more. Yeah, and I, I like that. Call it more parallelism, good. But I, I think it's very similar to what we see going on in Revelation. And, uh, you know, it, it would be interesting to go through the book of Ephesians and see if you can find any connections between 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3, and chapters 4 through 6. The uh, hortatory section, uh, resting, relying upon the uh, doctrinal section. So. <clears throat> yeah, I like, yeah, I like that, good point, I that concept too. Just because, I mean, otherwise, at some point it starts to collapse into basically just good writing, right? Like good writing, you're going to have like, kind of like what Wagner does with leitmotif, you know, you're going to have things coming back around repeated times. So, yeah, that makes sense. But once, yeah, once we're crossing the gospel of a John to Revelation, that's pretty... I don't know. That's a distance to span as well as like the epistles or whatever. Epistles right. of John. Um, your concept just there a second ago from Colossians, that makes, that, that resonates. That makes sense. I think I see a similar thing going on like in second Corinthians where, you know, you're setting out, he's setting out the glory of the ministry, but then as it turns out in the second half of it, when he starts making the request for the gift, it's basically like, 
he's setting out the glory of the ministry get to the second half. It's, okay, but you're in the ministry too. Like ministry is not just a me thing, but we're, right. we're all in the ministry in this sense. So I think yeah. I'm getting your concept right. There's some, some resonance there. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, term, terms aside, I, you know, don't get hung up on terms intertextuality, intertextuality, parallelism. The important point is, I think that God put these things here and he intends us to find them, whatever we want to call them. And we're missing something until we do. And, you know, you, you, you have a lot of authority in applying a passage like one, Colossians 128. You have a lot of authority if you can demonstrate to people, hey, look, this is the exact same phrase in the same book. What do you think God means by this? Um, is, does, he, does he intend something by this? I think people see that and say, yes. Yes, he does. I, I, I have the responsibility of doing what my pastor does, just on a different level, and uh, contributing to the spiritual success of my fellow believers. Which even uh, hermeneutically or, um, yeah, in terms of our Bible study, just drives us to read really attentively, yeah. you know, paying careful attention to phrases and things like that. It's the essence of good Bible study anyway. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely leading people in the right direction. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Very much appreciated. So, uh, and I appreciate you doing this in the middle of deputation. I've been there and lived, <laughs> lived that. So I know that you're, you're strapped for time and you're exhausted and even now you're sick. <laughs> we really appreciate you coming in. Um, yeah, thank you. And we will continue to take this with us, use it in our ministries, and we'll pray for your deputation to finish up and then for your ministry to come after that. So the, what, the, what the Lord's doing and planning already for you. Okay, thank you to all. Have a good night. We will see you next time on Monday and uh, look forward to continuing on with our lectures then. So thank you very much. Have a good night.